Back in 1889, Eleanor Marx, the daughter of the famous Karl Marx, believed that Silvertown was an end of the world place. Only five miles downstream from the Pool of London, it still seems like a place apart. Silvertown, of course, is almost an island, sandwiched between the Victoria and the Albert docks on one side and the River Thames on the other. In 1853, the businessman, Samuel Winkworth Silver, came over the river from Woolwich and converted a failed glass factory to manufacture rubberized cloth. It was a gamble, but he gambled well. The Victoria and Albert docks were under construction at the time. There was a steam launch service across the river from Woolwich and the railway was extended soon afterwards. Silver's business prospered and mutated into a colossal enterprise, which by 1889 was at the forefront of the electrical revolution and was spinning the telegraph lines that stitched together the British Empire. In 1889, too, it was the site of a fierce struggle between the fir firm and its striking workforce. Back in 1889, its streets teemed with labourers and their families drawn from the length and breadth of Britain and Ireland. They'd come to work on the great docks and in the golden mile of factories, which sent a cascade of profit into the pockets of rich investors. Today, only the Tate and Lyle sugar refinery remains to remind us of those times. Samuel Silver's India Rubber, Gutta Percha and Telegraph Works was the biggest and most lucrative of those factories. It occupied almost a mile of river, river frontage with its own wharves for its fleet of ocean going ships. 3000 men and women toiled with inside the great factory producing a myriad of commodities ranging from tennis balls, musical instruments, combs, etc. to electric motors, switch gear and dynamos. Silver's signature product was electric telegraph cables. Perhaps one quarter of the 200,000 miles of submarine cables that crisscrossed the ocean floors were made by the firm and laid down by its ships. The historian Daniel, Daniel Hedrick called them the tentacles of progress that bound together the greatest empire the world had ever seen. The firm was consistently profitable despite the stop-start nature of the telegraph laying business. And it was helped of course by its diverse products and also by huge government subsidies. Since its modest beginnings, Silver's factory had been free of labour troubles. There was a sprinkling of craft unionists inside the works. These were members of the carpenters, bricklayers and engineers unions, but the less skilled majority of the 3,000 workers were unorganised, as was the case with the British workforce as a whole at the time. With very few exceptions, the existing unions also restricted membership to males in the most highly skilled of the crafts or in niche occupations. Some craft unionists, in fact, were downright hostile to the idea of organising the unskilled. They had no conception of workers as a class with common interests, no conception of solidarity, and the idea of forming an independent Labour Party would have struck them as impractical or absurd. Even more bizarre in their eyes would be the idea that women could be trade unionists. Four great East End strikes upended all of that. In 1888, sweated women workers at Bryant and May's match factory in Bow went on strike. Most of them were Irish or of direct Irish descent. They were the, if you like, the most downtrodden of the working class in London. They ignored their well-meaning middle-class advisers and they went on strike and they stayed out until the company granted their demands and they also formed a permanent union. A few months later, workers at the huge Beckton gasworks near Silvertown won another stunning victory and set up a permanent union, the National Union of Gas Workers and General Labourers, the NUG and GL, which still exists today as the GMB. Next, 
In the summer of 1889, some of the most downtrodden and despised of the East End working class went on strike. These were some 16,000 casual dockers employed by the day or by the hour. They would turn up outside the dock gates hoping for scraps of work. They went out on strike for the famous dockers Tanner. Many of the dockers lived in or around Silvertown and worked on the nearby Victoria and Albert docks. No sooner had the dock strike ended than 3,000 workers worked off, walked off the job at Silver's Rubber and Telegraph Works. Thus began the new union movement that was to transform the face of Britain. Although it wasn't plain sailing, it took decades of, um, of fights and suffering and, and her heroism, actually, but it transformed the face of Britain. But at the time, virtually nobody saw it coming. The upsurge caught both the establishment and working class agitators by surprise. Frederick Engels was utterly stunned that in the space of a few months, his preconceptions about the East End were turned on their head. Socialists had despaired of organising the un unorganised, despite the horrible social conditions endured by the British working class. And the statistics from the time are really grim. In 1889, a Silvertown worker could not expect to live long after the age of 35, and many Londoners died destitute or in the spike, the dreaded workhouse. Despite chronic diseases, there were no hospitals in Silvertown or nearby, and the people could not afford doctor's fees. In one slum school, the teacher was obliged to bring an umbrella in wet weather to shelter from the leaks from the roof. 55% of East End children died before the end of their fifth year. In 1906, the infant mortality rate in Silvertown was 181 per 1,000 live births. In comparison, in war-torn Afghanistan today, the rate is just under 136 per thousand. Silvertown had drawn the attention of Charles Dickens as a scandalously unhealthy place. Another contemporary writer claimed it consisted of islands of th liquid filth surrounded by stagnant dikes. The ancient embankments sometimes overflowed and the air was full of noxious fumes from the factories. The work regime at Silvers was onerous under the petty tyranny of the overseers. The nominal working week was, 30, was 59 hours, but overtime was compulsory and it was paid at single time. Women and girls were paid a fraction of the male rates for the same work. In early September, inspired by the dockers and other victories, the workers had had enough. They worked off the job, walked off the job department by department and set up picket lines around the huge plant. Manager Matthew Gray claimed that the workers were well paid and that they went on strike because they were led by the nose by outside agitators with sinister agendas. In fact, the strike erupted spontaneously, although there was a core of dedicated rank and file organisers inside the plant. And foremost among these was a stoker called F Fred Ling, a Silvertown man who was employed in the company's huge boiler house. Ling knew that organisation was the key to success. As a stoker, he would have known of the new union set up by the stokers at the Beckton Gasworks, and it's possible that he already knew the union's leader, Will Thorne. The strike committee caused, called for assistance from Thorne's new union and from the socialists who'd led the recent dock strike. These socialists were remarkable people thrown up in remarkable times. They included the Beckton strike leader, Will Thorne, and his comrade, Pete Curran, from the Woolwich Arsenal, the dockers leader, Ben Tillett, and Tom Mann and John Burns from the Amalgamated Society of Engineers. Workers themselves, they lived and breathed the emancipation of their class all were fiery platform speakers, proficient journalists and meticulous organisers. They were joined by a young middle-class blue stocking 
Eleanor Marx, the feisty daughter of Karl Marx. These men and women were members of Britain's first avowedly Marxist organisation, the Social Democratic Federation. They believed that the road to socialism lay via the day-to-day -day struggles of the working class, and this meant striving to build inclusive general unions that would accept all comers, regardless of occupation, age, gender, race or ethnicity. Moreover, they believed that the road to the mass political organisation of the working class lay through building such unions. Thus, they were ready, willing and able to lead the mass upsurge of what became known as the new unions. Ling and his comrades set to organising the Silvertown strike along the lines of the dock strike. The key was mass mobilisation of the workers and their families and sympathisers. Picket rosters had to be drawn up, mass parades and rallies organised, and leaflets produced to rebut the claims of the employers and the Tory press. Crucial too was the need to raise strike funds for few, if any, of the strikers and their families um, had any savings to fall back on. Finally, they had to persuade all of the Silvers workers to join the strike, and that included members of the craft unions. The strikers weren't asking for much. A modest pay increase, payment of overtime at time and a half and double time on Sundays, and recognition of the National Union of Gas Workers and General Labourers as their bargaining agent. The company could certainly afford to pay. The weather was warm, a real Indian summer, and with the success of the dock strike, the strikers must have been confident of success. With hindsight, we can see that there were ominous developments working against a quick victory. The earlier mass strikes had caught the employers flat-footed and much of middle-class public opinion had sympathised with the strikers. By the end of the dock strike, however, middle-class public opinion had swung against the strikers. It had also dawned on the employers and their friends in Parliament and the press that the strike wave was snowballing and was threatening the interests of the entire establishment. So they began to prepare for class war and Silvertown was in the front line. The Silvertown strikers had also taken on one of the wealthiest and best connected companies in the land. Silvers was a heavy industrial manufacturer at the technological cutting edge with enormous capital reserves. At a time when streets were lit with gas and houses with candles, Silvers was lit with electricity generated in its own powerhouse. Its fleet of ships plied the ocean, spooling out thousands of miles of cables manufactured according to strict quality control. Ominously for the strikers, because of the strategic and commercial importance of the electrical telegraph to the far-flung empire, the company received large government subsidies. And the government knew full well the value of the industry. The telegraph has been called the Victorian internet with good reason. For the first time in human history, communications were not dependent on slow terrestrial transportation or on the short distance vagaries of the optical telegraph or the semaphore. The Indian mutiny of 1859 was a wake-up call to the empire's rulers. If similar rebellions broke out across the empire, reinforcements could be summoned in an instant instead of taking months. The socialist new union leaders were dynamic and committed, but they had a worthy opponent in Matthew Gray, the managing director of the Telegraph Works. Appointed in 1866, Gray appears to have worked his way up from the shop floor to managerial positions. Under his stewardship, the company expanded and morphed from a petty commodity producer into a colossus of heavy industry. Once the strike began, the company's board gave him a free hand in how to counter it. From his offices in Cannon Street in the city, Gray was plugged into establishment networks and Silver's shareholders included the Prime Minister himself, Lord Salisbury. After reneging on an early deal with the company's 150-strong yard gang, 
Gray adopted an implacably hostile stance to the strikers. He refused all offers of mediation and denied all but the most trivial of the strikers' demands. Over the three months of the strike, Gray developed an approach that became a model for defeating subsequent new union strikes across Britain and Ireland. In addition to his re refusal to negotiate, accept mediation or recognise the union, he waged an unrelenting unrel propaganda war in the columns of the nation's press. The strikers, he said, were honest men and women, but they were misled by sinister agitators. Strikers deemed to be guilty of intimidation were vigorously prosecuted by the company's solicitors, even if the offences consisted of hooting at scabs crossing picket lines. Finally, Gray persuaded Police Commissioner Munro to deploy large numbers of police in Silvertown. These acted as security for the company in a partisan way, with inspectors persuading reluctant um, strike breakers to return to work. The strike had been largely peaceful until the police arrived, but the press blamed violent clashes on the strikers. Taken together, Matthew Gray's methods can be described as the Silvertown model of dealing with strikes, and this was used to great effect in the next decade across the length and breadth of Britain and Ireland. The Silvertown strikers fought doggedly. Up to 10,000 people rallied in support in great demonstrations. Mass picketing continued and young women strikers literally wore out their shoes collecting for the strike fund. The union was one of the first in the land to admit women and one of Eleanor's great achievements was the creation of a women's branch of the National Union of Gas Workers and General Labourers in Silvertown. For this reason alone, the strike should not be forgotten. But funds were drying up as the strike dragged on into a cold, wet autumn. Workers at the company's French factory at Persan, near, Par near Paris, refused to support their British counterparts, and the craft unions refused to call out their members in sympathy. By the time the first snows of winter settled on the Silvertown Marsh, there was a trickle back to work and then a flood. Matthew Gray's plan had been to starve the strikers back to work and with their tr children crying out for bread, he won. The unions, like any other movement, prefer to remember their victories and forget their defeats. Yet as the strike committee noted when it voted to end the strike, the struggle was an earnest of future demands on the part of underpaid labour. The Silvertown unions rode out the brutal class wars of the 1890s depression. Fred Ling was victimised after the strike, but he remained as secretary of the local union branch, and he joined the agitation that led to the election of independent workers MPs in the district and to the creation of the Labour Party. In 1892, Keir Hardy was elected as the Labour MP the Independent Labour MP for West Ham South, and Will Thorne became its Labour member in 1906. Silvertown can look back with pride to the achievements of those early pioneers of political and industrial labour, and it is a pity that the 1889 strike was largely forgotten. Mm -hmm.